thank you for uh, having me. Um, I'm going to try and move along because I know we have 50 minutes, you said, or so. All right. I'm going to try and move along. Feel free to ask questions at any point. So to kind of start, I'll tell you a little bit about myself um, and hopefully do all this in about 30 minutes. Um, but hello. And usually people ask, you know, so what do you do? And turns out I'm known for uh, a lot of things, uh, at least sketch related things online. So in 2008, started a website called idsketching.com, which was a precursor to sketchaday.com, which is what I focus on now. Um, and kind of how that started was just seeing an opportunity. And as I talk, there'll be lots of lessons here that I think I've learned in life that may apply to you. So um, feel free to, to be inspired as you choose. So saw an opportunity where there was a, a gap in terms of education. Um, and I wanted to give back, you know, I went to BYU, <clears throat> pardon me, back in the day. And at the time, there wasn't much by way of uh, online education for sketching and kind of had an aptitude for, for drawing and visual communication, something that I, that I enjoy and enjoyed at the time quite a bit. So saw that opportunity, a friend of mine and I, who, well, he works at GoPro now, um, is one of the principal designers. We decided, hey, let's let's start a website because we saw a YouTube clip in which someone was drawing a car. It was terrible. We thought we can do better than this. So we started this website. Um, it was a huge success at the time. And then kind of retool some things. I wanted to be able to branch out a little bit outside of ID specifically. So started Sketch a Day. And since then have been uh, presenting. And I guess I'll have to add USU to this and a few others um, on this slide in particular as you know, since then I've had opportunities to travel all over the world and uh, present on a variety of topics, creativity, visual communication, career development, um, strategic thinking, and so forth. So it all began for me in school, as I mentioned, I went to BYU down in Provo. Um, and school for me was an interesting time because I was transitioning from uh, mathematics, which is what I was studying, to design. And I remember just feeling not so much apprehensive, but anxious about the whole experience. Hey, this is so different. But it was important for me at the time. I, I wanted to make sure I was able to soak in as much as possible. So it's my first bit of advice on school. Be a sponge. Take an opportunity to learn as much as you can. Um, dabble, uh, experiment, try different things. So with that ID sketching website, for example, I was able to use uh, experience and knowledge I had in coding to build my own CMS at the time and website, but I wouldn't have been able to do that if I wasn't willing to experiment and take some classes and try uh, different things. So I was able to have that experience. And school was great. You know, I had, had lots of ups and downs, um, worked really hard, had some great experiences. And through school, I was actually able to land my first gig, and that was at Astro Studios. But my story with Astro Studios, and they're a design studio in San Francisco, if you haven't heard of them or are familiar uh, with them. Uh, my, my story with them started while I was at school. I was a sophomore. And at the time, sophomores didn't really uh, go on internships. But I had a, I had a portfolio. I took a portfolio class and I don't have the teaser here with me. And teasers back in the day were, were a lot different uh, than they, than they likely are now. Um, but I had, you know, just a 10 slide uh, PDF little booklet that I was able to share out. But it's a story of being in the right place at the right time and being prepared. Those two things. So I was just hanging out in the, uh, I wasn't even supposed to be there, really. <laughs> I used to hang out with the juniors and seniors quite a bit. So I was hanging out near the junior studio, and a professor of mine came out and said, hey, Spencer, do you, do you have a portfolio? And I was like, yeah, I do. <laughs> um, which, again, was not normal or typical at the time, at least nothing that uh, would have been considered uh, worth sharing. So he then said... Uh, Astro Studios is looking for an intern. And I thought, whoa, okay, <laughs> that's cool. 
who's Astro? Because <laughs> I had no idea at the time and he told me a little bit. So submitted my portfolio and they were actually looking for a, and there's, there's a reason for this image. They were looking for an intern to fill a gap for six weeks. So I said, sure, let's do it. I'm going to move to San Francisco for six weeks and move back. And I thought, you know, this is, I was, I was a, admittedly a little bit miffed, you know, that it was just six weeks, but also looked at that as an opportunity, you know, Hey, I've never been to San Francisco. Uh, I get to, to be there. Um, they're going to pay me well enough that I'll, I'll be able to, you know, pay my rent and so forth. So moved to San Francisco, started Astro and surprise, Hey, we actually don't have a desk for you <laughs> because as the stopgap intern, you, you don't, I didn't have a computer. I didn't have a desk. Um, I didn't have at least initially the things that would have been given to the other interns, <clears throat> but I didn't let that stop me or, or, you know, put me out. So I was set up at the conference table <clears throat> And every day I would just sit with these awesome senior designers, creative directors, and just, you know, work as hard as possible. So lots of sketching, lots of discussion, lots of critique sessions. And it was really fast paced. It was like being like this astronaut on fire, um, on fire because of the opportunity, but also um, there's just so much learning and growth in that experience. Well, as the stopgap intern, I wasn't uh, necessarily, you know, at the same level as everyone else. I mean, the other uh, the other interns coming in were you know, juniors, so I'd always try and push myself to at least be equivalent in skill. Eventually, I did get a computer, um, and uh, was able to to uh, keep up. But lots of great memories. You know, I was I was the bagel guy. <laughs> I would get bagels for meetings on Mondays. I would do all the recycling. Um, I even helped them move to this new space, which is uh, where this shot of the logo comes from. But as the time uh, of that six week period was winding down, I thought, you know, I'm having, real, I'm having a lot of fun being on an internship. I should also add as an international student, so it was important for me to be uh, employed at the time if I wasn't in school, okay, and under certain conditions. So I was actively looking for other opportunities, eventually Target uh, said, yeah, come on out, let's, let's have you do an internship. And so as the six-week period is winding down, I said to one of the creative directors or vice presidents of design, I forget at the time, I forget what his title is, but I, I remember Ian very well, and we're still friends, but I said, hey, um, Target wants me to come out to Minneapolis. So thank you for everything. And I'm just letting you know, that's where I'm going. And he looks at me all confused, like, why are you leaving? <laughs> and I said, hey, you know, because this was a six week thing. And he said, no, you can stay here as long as you want. We love what you're doing. Um, you're doing awesome. So that was, that was interesting. And I guess the lesson there I learned was, again, being prepared, being ready, having a portfolio. And I was able to use that same teaser portfolio with a few additions from Astro to create some interest at other companies, including Target. So that was, that was encouraging to hear and certainly motivating to know that I had a place at Astro. It was cool. And Astro is a special place uh, in terms of what I learned there, but also um, I'm going to actually skip these two slides because I repeated them. Um, in terms of what I learned, but also the friendships, the relationships that I was able to form and so forth. So where is that going with this? Uh, oh yeah. So I stayed there and then went back to uh, school, finished up and, you know, in between then and graduating, I had other experiences, was able to intern at GM General Motors. So I got uh, a different experience. You know, a car is a product essentially, and I could draw cars. I wasn't a car designer per se. I wasn't a car guy, but uh, Brett Lovelady, who's the, uh, I guess, CEO of Astro Studios, gave me some advice. And that advice was, as much as you can, get diverse experiences, okay? Because that's going to help you 
be as versatile as a designer as you can be. And so I did. And I was nervous and I didn't, you know, I doubted myself. And I, I should have included some pictures from that time at GM here, but it, it was a great experience in that it pushed me in ways that <clears throat> I wouldn't have experienced had I decided to just stay comfortable with what I wanted to do. All right. Anyhow, as I mentioned, um, after Astro started Sketch a Day, or it was kind of while at Astro, so I would travel occasionally and do... Um, do workshops here and there. Eventually, some of you, if you were working professionally at the time, remember in 2008, 2009, re recession hit. And that was an interesting time. I was still at Astro. And I remember watching and seeing the furloughs that were happening. So they had this glass conference room and you could kind of see when people were being called in and they would leave with their head a little bit lower than than how it was when they walked in. And we could tell, you know, that the juniors and those who had started after myself and, and uh, my friend John at the time, we would just see it happen. And eventually our turn came and we were called in. And given the news that we were going to be furloughed, which basically meant, hey, they can't pay us. So good luck. <laughs> Um, you can come in and work, but we can't pay you. So, you know, people would opt to not work, of course, and not come in. But we decided, hey, what better time to start a business <laughs> when, you know, the economy is crashing? I mean, we were certainly optimistic and young, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed. But it was actually a good time to start a business. We decided to create a studio. You know, we had, at that time, about two years' experience which isn't a ton. So we had, we learned some hard lessons along the way as we started this studio called Studio T minus. And we actually left San Francisco, went to Sacramento and that became kind of home base for us. But T minus was, like I said, it was, it was a learning experience. We learned a lot of hard things as we were you know, prepping this, this rocket ship, if you will, to launch no affiliation with the design firm here in Utah. But it was rough. <laughs> you know, we were in business for about five years. And in those five years, learned so much um, about resilience, grit, hard work. Um, hopefully, you're hearing a familiar theme here. But I remember one instance in particular, in the I remember putting together a business plan. And the first year, you know, having these lofty goals and aspirations about what we we're going to do. I think we made $20,000 that first year. It was rough. You know, thankfully our spouses at the time were supportive and we had at least some room to experiment and grow. So there was this one day in particular, we were just, you know, looking at our situation or circumstances, uh, being new parents or expecting parents, um, recognizing that we had responsibilities and we thought, man, we're not getting any work. We have to do something. And Sacramento was a lot different than San Francisco. Um, we decided to just get off our butts, I guess, and then go knock some doors. So we get out, <clears throat> go to this local business park. We're just knocking doors and uh, probing and just asking people, hey, do you have any work? We'll do anything. You know, we'll do anything. Um, I remember even walking into a, a t-shirt shop and being like, we'll do some graphics. We'll do anything. Not exactly a high point in my career or experience, but a high point in the sense that it, it taught me a lesson that um, you have to be willing to do what it takes. Okay. And didn't get any business that day. Didn't get any, uh, at least anything. Yeah, we didn't, we didn't get any actionable contracts or things that would pay, but it did help put us in the right frame of mind. Okay. And I don't know if this is necessarily so, but maybe the universe life was like, okay, you're willing to put in the effort. So here are some opportunities. So shortly after that, we were able to uh, draw up some work through some older clients um, through this is this is back when flip phones and slider phones and BlackBerry style devices were a thing, uh, built out brand languages, um, put together concepts for Kyocera at the time, also created an identity for, I should have included another shot here uh, on the lower right, but <clears throat> a company called DFI Tech, which did some 
uh, server type stuff. I may have a, a slide here actually. Yeah, I do have a follow-up slide for that. So I was able to draw up that work, created the brand language for Verifone's uh, new point of sale units. It's changed somewhat, but if you go into certain stores, you'll actually see uh, that unit on the top left um, with some changes. It's a little portable. This is when EMV technology was being developed and they wanted a new look and feel for their point of sale units Did work with Altic Lansing to, at least at the time, conceptually come up with uh, some competitive products for that would go head to head with Sonos, for example. And here's some more of that DFI business. So we did really well. Um, and like many things in life, you know, we ride waves, we uh, are aware of sunrises and sunsets. And at the time, it just felt like, hey, you know, John, we're, we're kind of pushing up on a limit here as far as what we can do. So it's either we hire and grow and invest in what we're doing or go and have different experiences. And so we decided that we were going to go have different experiences, which led to corporate life for both John and myself. So John ended up working, like I said, for GoPro. He's still there as a principal creative now. Um, I ended up at a small Utah company called Vivint. And this was by way of acquisition of a startup that John and I had worked on, a startup called Space Monkey. They're a data storage um, device company. So this is version two of that device that uh, I'm actually looking at the prototypes in my studio here. Uh, but this is, it, it was an interesting experience, um, you know, being able to work with a startup for one, uh, constraint being kind of a, a prevailing theme with, with startups constraint and funds in terms of time, what you can accomplish, having to always be innovative and so forth. But because of that connection that we had made, <clears throat> pardon me, with Studio T Minus, I was able to get on board the Space Monkey and work on this product, which was then acquired by Vivint. Um, had a lot of great experiences. I think with, with design, one of the things I realized career-wise is that up until this point, I had been a consultant and kind of a, a free designer. And that means that you're really focused on targeted activities within the range of design activities you might experience. So for example, as a consultant, you might get hired to do what's called front-end design work. But even then, that front-end design work doesn't include deciding what gets designed and for whom it gets designed, but more so being tasked with the activity of creating the artifact that then would land in people's homes. So being at Vivint was awesome. Got to be involved in the full spectrum, right? From product conception to the development process to tackling technical things, pardon me, like airflow, um, thermal constraints, RF thing, radio frequency interference, for example, um, being able to work more closely with engineering teams uh, domestically and abroad to figure out and tackle tough problems. Um, this was from an, a shot from uh, Taiwan when I was able to visit, uh, working on the Vivint doorbell uh, version two. You may have seen these, maybe not. Um, I believe a new one's coming out, but don't quote me on that. In any case, was the, was the lead designer on this project, was able to visit and interface with uh, engineering teams and ultimately released a few products. This is just one of them, but um, have a few products that I worked on at my time there in Vivint. Was able to work on user experience projects, uh, became more exposed and involved in uh, UI type projects, uh, eventually landed in a design strategy role, uh, working on new product initiatives. And that was really fun. And that's where we would kind of conceptualize and test ideas to see if they would be viable in the market, right? So rough prototypes, man behind the curtain type stuff, um, trying to decide strategically which direction the company itself should go. So that was really fun. So career-wise kind of came full circle to uh, being a creator and educator. So again, so what do you do? And it's really, I've kind of distilled and focused on 
yeah, I'm a, I'm a creator and educator. That's what I do. All right. And lately I've been involved in a program called Offsite and that's with the Advanced Design Organization uh, nonprofit, but Offsite is, is, a, is an educational experience that we provide that bridges the gap between what you might learn in school and what you might uh, experience in the real world. Sometimes there's a little bit of a gap and the learning curve can be extremely steep. So we try to, to ease that a bit in uh, creating bridge experiences and educational content for uh, anyone interested, really. And, and frankly, in our program, we, we take about 60 students at a time right now. It's all online. And we have a, a wide gamut of people that, that attend. Some are industry professionals who've been at it for 20 years, and some are uh, still in school in their undergraduate program, and others are uh, new professionals who maybe just starting out. So we have a wide range of, of activities there. Also, as you can see, I'm in my studio here, but have had opportunities to work uh, closely with Adobe and a few others, Google, creating educational content related to visual communication, creative thinking. I was able to travel the world, like I said, work through Adidas um, for some time. I've also been illustrating and just creating things that um, I want to, leaning into things like fine art, experimenting a little bit um, here and there, and of course, Still, still pumping out the sketches. Um, as far as other things I'm up to, so I have a, an entity that I, I created called 5050. And 5050 is really, uh, it's, it's an experimental thing my sister and I are doing. And we quite often come up with, with concepts and we're working on a few right now. But really it's, it's about uh, maintaining a, a balanced relationship with my creativity and design. So what I mean to say is half my time I try to spend on uh, commissions or client projects and the other half of the time are self-initiated uh, creative experiments and activities. So things like pouring resin, seeing what happens. Uh, that, was, that was a fun project. Um, and I'll just share a couple that worked on with my sister. So Moment was a, an installation piece that we created for a charity show called the Misplaced Showcase and discovered or at least realized that, and this is just a story of the artifact itself, which I'll show you in just a sec. Um, we, we kind of pulled from our own experiences and realized, hey, you know, we're always in the kitchen talking and the kitchen kind of was uh, a central and, and still is a central meeting place for us where we have some of our most meaningful conversations. So we wanted to create uh, this piece that was kind of an artifact that represented where we would often congregate and also contextualize it with uh, things found in that, pardon me, environment. There's no turning back. care if it gets on top of the stuff, right? No. You're good for it. <laughs> Just pour it? Mm -hmm. You're good. So that's my sister, my partner in crime, um, also created some other artifacts for the show. And these will be relevant for the next uh, few pieces that we created as well. But ultimately, it was a hit. It was awesome. Um, that's kind of how it turned out. Just a couple of pictures there. So what like i said ended up being this artifact this was actually a tabletop and then converted in, into a wall hanging and um now it's safely and securely mounted oh and i forgot it's it's it's, it's illuminated inside but i haven't shown it here so that's your first uh watch out for portfolios as i show you a bad example <laughs> i'm talking about things that i'm not showing but um, you want to, you just want to make sure you have a visual representation of what you're what you're typically showing. Um, but as this is an abbreviated presentation, I don't have that. If you want to see more, you can visit the website 5050.design. So another experiment, and that's kind of what we call them experiments, as they tend to be, uh, at least I I like to take the approach that these are open ended um, and ongoing activities because creativity for me is a lot like uh, it's it's fleeting like a butterfly it just comes and goes and sometimes it's there and sometimes it's not and 
you know, we're, we're inspired by the, the experiences um, that we have in life, certainly, and they color the things we work on. All right. I've got like 40 slides to go through. So I'm going to go through these really quick, but they're mostly pictures of the artifacts created here. So VSL stands for Very Salt Lake, or in other words, Vessel. And as I mentioned before, uh, it's a project inspired by that image that I showed, which is in the background here, of these bottles. Um, it is a series of continuing experiments involving a variety of materials um, and kind of started with reclaiming bottles, right? I was acquiring all these bottles and wanted to do something with them. So decided to uh, cut bottles, started with, okay, maybe, maybe this could be some sort of home decor thing, you know, some storage vessel. Uh, then I thought, what if I put a light inside? What would that look like? A little tea light. Um, ultimately decided to add a few more things, copper wire, for example, silica, cutting bottles, right? So this is me cutting a bottle at home. Silica, glass, wood, right? Cutting wood, I have a little CNC in my garage um, in a wood shop. Um, and then also combining that with concrete and began by exploring. And as you know, I love sketching. So it kind of started with lots of sketch exploration ultimately. And, and for, for more context, this happened during the pandemic. So had to be uh, efficient and creative in terms of working spaces. So a lot of this took place in my kitchen and my whole home was taken over with, with these little prototypes. And as you can see, it was 3D printing as well. Um, printing things like threads and uh, housings for lights and so forth, eventually wired it all up. So following are just a, a few shots. And again, you can check this out on the website. And this all culminated with a show that I uh, put together in my driveway and kind of made it a, a local community event. So the first were some blocks and was able to reclaim uh, cutoffs and actually got these for free. Um, you know, went to Mech Beats, Hardwood in Salt Lake. I was like, hey, you know, do you have any any eight quarter stock that I could use? And this guy was was generous enough to provide me with those. So here's just a few of those combinations. Tabletop lights. And I guess another lesson here would be as you go through a process, sometimes accidents happen. In this case, my son was kind of playing around, hit this one, fell and broke. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. Cause he was freaking out. I was like, oh, I'm so sorry, dad. And I was like, it's okay, it's okay. And I paused and thought, oh, I wonder what this could be. So decided to dip the edge of the uh, bottle in uh, elastomer, right? And that created its own aesthetic. Uh, found another bottle in and mimic that as well. And these are all meant to at least aesthetically be part of a family. So you'll notice uh, similar colors and uh, aesthetic treatments on things like the cord or uh, the strain reliefs and mounting pieces. Here's another one. And what's interesting about this one is as I and, and sometimes with design, when you get into the process, that's when you find the answers. I, could, I, I didn't sketch this up or think about it. What I'll show you in, uh, at least before getting into the project, but as I was working discovered, oh, this loop actually creates a natural friction point, but it's loose enough that the weight of the light housing and the friction of the cable allows this light or lamp to be adjustable. So um, one of the features here being that the position of the light could be adjustable. Um, experimented with some other concepts and combined processes to create some other uh, lights here. Just a couple of detail shots. And also did a floor set. So have these floor lights as well. Um, again, and hopefully you can see the material, the colors and shapes corresponding with each other, meant to evoke a sense of, uh, hey, these are part of, part of a perhaps set, all right? And use a similar uh, strain relief or adjustability on this concept once that discovery was made. 
And like I said, ended up having a show, set it up in my driveway. Um, I initially wanted to do this in a gallery, but again, we didn't really know what was happening. COVID had just hit. And so tried to be a bit cautious and careful, but ended up being a success. It was really fun. Um, and it was really cool to actually be able to share some of uh, some of my passion with people that I wasn't necessarily uh, working with at the time. So just a couple examples there of some work that I've done. And with that, I'll open it up to questions. So we have about 12 minutes. Uh, Spencer, I've got one for you. All right. Um, I mean, it looks like you've done some amazing things, like gone really far with your career. What advice would you give to somebody that's like in our position in a junior in high school, or junior in college? Sorry. Um, <laughs> well, if you're in high school, the first step, is go to college. Yeah. Fair, fair. But yeah, no, it just looks like you've done some awesome stuff. And like, it's honestly a little daunting. Like, what what advice do you have for us? It's just Yeah, like I mean, that thing is like I'm in a unique position where I've created <laughs> I've created a persona that's I guess bigger than myself sometimes I, I realize that and I think this and this will answer your question my advice to you would be get exposure where you can um, it used to be really hard for people to discover who you are now it's super easy put your work out there when you do that, it's going to, and it's one of the things I realized with Sketch a Day and ID Sketching, when you put your work out there, it opens yourself up to tremendous pressure and criticism. If you're ready for that, people on the internet are ruthless. They will say all sorts of stuff to you about your work, but it also gives you an opportunity to, to rise to the occasion or accept that challenge and push yourself. All right. When, when you're authentic online and you put yourself out there, I think it can create opportunities for you to connect with people. Many of the clients, projects, the opportunities I have are a result of that. Like I can, I can say my life now is a result of that risk I took. So put your work out there. Um, don't underestimate the relationships you're forming now with your classmates, but also if you get exposure to professionals, um, pardon my, my, language but don't be a dick just be be cool <laughs> be a normal person and it sounds perhaps simple but so for example last year I did about five figures in work for Adobe and it's not something that I would have anticipated or experienced just mainlining industrial design it's something that happened because I met a friend about 10 years ago and randomly they reached out hey do you still do this drawing thing and I was like yeah and they were like sweet I work for Adobe here's what we're looking for and from there I was able to meet other people within the company and create these relationships that have helped um, help helped create work opportunities for myself so put yourself out there um, focus on your relationships and I guess the, the third lesson I would say, and hopefully you pick this up in the presentation is just work hard. You know, um, life's a lot simpler, hopefully for you now than it will be 10 years from now, as many things can happen. Uh, you put roots down, in my case, you have kids, whatever the case may be. Um, and life's, life's real simple, take chances, right? Make mistakes, failure is an opportunity to learn. It's not a moment of shame and, uh, disappointment so much as it is an opportunity to ask yourself, what can I learn from this? You know, hey, I, had, I did this experiment. I, I did this show. What, what did I learn from this in retrospective, right? So those are three things I would say right now. There's a long answer to your, your very simple question. No, that was great. appreciate it. Thank you. Now, if you have specific portfolio questions, I do have my own portfolio. Um, just on the ready, if there were questions I can show visuals, but I'm not going to go through the whole thing because it's like 60 pages. <laughs> so. Um, is your portfolio online that we could look at in our spare time? Um, I, okay. So with portfolios, it's a little bit tricky in the sense that, and this is where I get a little skittish about recording. Sometimes in portfolios, there's a little bit of gray area where you may show something that is still under non-disclosure, 
but if I show it in a way that is abstract enough or without context, it's okay. Me leaving my portfolio up online is not something I do at this point in my career because I don't have to show a portfolio, if that makes sense. Um, eventually, you get to that point where people know who you are, they know your work, and I'm kind of there where I just I just don't typically show it. But if I have um, new experiences, um, I'm trying to think of, I've had companies, uh, certain large companies, ask me, "Hey, do you have a portfolio?" and I'll say, "Okay, yeah, here's a link to my portfolio. You can take a look at it." But I don't I don't typically leave it up. Got a question for you, Spencer. Um, All right. You talked about diversity of experiences and getting as many experiences as possible. Um, how does that translate into a portfolio? Like as you were coming up, I, I know that some of our students uh, debate what to put in their portfolio, what to not include. Do I have a variety of products um, in different categories or do I try to focus? What What are your thoughts on that? In, in um, so here's an example, I think. And this is something that might come with more with experience than something you might think of initially, but even being able to map out a user experience in a true sense, um, I do believe that industrial designers are the original UX designers as our interactions with products uh, that, that close the gap on problems we may have. We're physical, you know, we're the ones who were creating those artifacts. So <clears throat> in that sense, creating things like a journey map in a visual way, in, in your own style. Don't be something you're not. <laughs> be who you are and be the best you you can be. Because that is, that's people, you want to work with people that are authentically who they are. Now, it doesn't mean that you have to silo yourself into one thing. And, and this will answer your question. It doesn't mean you have to silo, silo yourself in one thing. But if you're going to show an experience, show it in the way that you do. So here's an example. Um, of perhaps a component I might show that speaks to, okay, here's my user experience thinking. Um, let's see, there's another one. Maybe it's, hey, here's, here's how I've worked with engineers or engineering, um, but also showcasing a little bit of CAD skill. Um, of course, sketch exploration. Let's see, development. You'd seen this slide before. Um, or it might be, hey, Here's, here's another thing. It's like, oh, you can do exhibit design too? Wow, that's really cool. Um, so I think showing little beats in your career or your experience rather that are divergent and different. It's like, okay, so you did the design, but you also fabricated it and installed. Cool. So can you complete a project? What does the process look like? Can you show process? Um, maybe some CAD and rendering as well um, for conceptualizing uh, it could be higher fidelity renderings um, let's see here user interaction okay and yeah just raw skill here and there so i'd say just show things that really just cut across um cut across a variety of skills and and you'll be fine whatever that may be great thank you I have a question. Sure. So your portfolio is very like tech based. Uh -huh. Do you do like all the electrical engineering side of things yourself or do you work with an electrical engineer typically? Um, typically it's like this where I'm working with a team and like if I'm so on, on this project specifically as the designer, I was responsible for what's called the A surfaces on the product which basically means all this exterior housing are surfaces that I created. So I had to create it in a way that was moldable. It could dry, it, it could be uh, extracted from a, a mold as it was injection molded. Um, I designed the, let's see if I have a shot here on this one. Yeah, I should blow out this project a little bit, but I designed this back plate, for example, and this was meant to dissipate heat in a certain efficient way. So I was given guidelines and then within those guidelines, you can then fine tune the aesthetics to say, okay, this should work, right? I've followed the, the guidelines here, um, but I'm, I'm always almost, almost always working in conjunction with an engineer. 
what you'll find is that it's not so much that you need to have deep technical knowledge as you do need to have familiarity with what is plausible or feasible in terms of engineering and what what works for the company. So if, if I decided, hey, this, this white doorbell is actually made of ceramic and I insist on it being ceramic, a company will look at me and go, well, there's no way we can afford that because we're not going to spend 50 bucks on a single part because that means the entire product would have to be sold for $600, right? If that one part is ceramic or whatever, like there's, there's ripple effects and, and understanding what's possible certainly helps. Um, but I, I'm not what I would consider to be a design engineer so much as I've worked with enough engineers that I know what's possible and plausible. I've got a, a quick question. It seems like <laughs> okay. um, you're working on so many projects all at once. What's your, what are some tips to kind of manage your time? I mean, you have, it seems like you're juggling a lot of things. Yeah, that's, that's how I like to work. Um, <laughs> I, I don't, I don't like to silo myself into one thing and say, I am a shoe designer or I am a this designer. So uh, it, it, it's inefficient in some ways because when you, when you mode, when you switch modes, oftentimes there's a, a dip in productivity and then a ramp up to where you can hit your flow state where your skills match the task and the ideas start to really, really come out. For me, what I find helpful is every day just focusing on three things. Um, so today I, I'm going to go for a drive because <laughs> I think it's important to take some time uh, to yourself. And I have a video to produce that I've been kind of chewing on in my head. I do a lot of my design not on paper. It sounds weird, but while I'm doing something else, I'll be conceptualizing something so that by the time I get to paper or digital or CAD or whatever, I know exactly, not exactly, but I have a a good idea of what it is I want to accomplish. Um, and then what else was I doing today? Oh, some writing, because I'm working on, on a, I'm working on collecting my knowledge and experience in a way that's shareable. I'll just put it that way. So if you focus on three things, at least if, if I focus on three things for the day, then it's a little easier for me to say, okay, I know exactly what to do. Um, and it helps uh, constrain a bit of my creative energy and focus on, on those things. Now, what I try to do as well is have an overall idea of what I want to accomplish in a given month or quarter or year. Okay. And so those three things kind of align with that, that main goal. And for me, that, that kind of works and helps me just focus on those larger objectives. So that kind of segues into a question that I have about where you find and seek inspiration. Where do I find and seek inspiration? Um, everywhere, really. Um, sometimes it's, hey, that's a really interesting rock. I've never noticed the surface in that. And that's speaking specifically to aesthetic inspiration. Other times it might be combining functionality of one thing to another. Um, in the case of, let's see, if I have these here. So in the case of this project, for example, um, there was, let's see if I can. So there was some exploration done on cooling on top of the device. And at first glance, it might seem random and scattershot, but we had certain uh, aesthetic prompts to help guide that process. Um, and sometimes they're not merely aesthetic, but thematic to the product. And this was a networking device, essentially. So we wanted to create a sense of connectivity or connectedness. Ultimately, the fourth option. So this option ended up being actually the, the, a good blend of <clears throat> uh, thematically relevant aesthetics, but also performative functionally. There's things you might not even know about electronic devices like, hey, if you put a hole in the top of a product, it has to be big enough to not allow a pencil to go through. That's actually a standard test that they do, for example. Um, or things like uh, spill test. If water goes on top, what happens to the water? How is it routed? Um, is it routed away from uh, things that potentially cause a fire? 
So where I'm going with this is that the inspiration here was thematic more so than aesthetic. And it also ended up being the most performative thermally for the product, which meant it was the most reliable. So it's it's kind of finding the balance between what you may, might want to do aesthetically and what's best for the product, but also when you can tie it in, it's awesome. So in that sense, where do I find my inspiration? Sometimes it's specific to a theme within the product, connectedness. Sometimes it's uh, just all around you. Like I said, you might see something outside um, or, hey, this thing has an interesting function. Maybe we'll, it would be interesting if I combined A plus B or asking questions. What if, what if I cut a bottle? What could that be? So I've got a question for you. All right. Um, as far as like project link goes, like in your portfolio, you have like a lot of projects to include. Um, so you notice most of your things are like one or two slides. What would you do as far as like project link, especially when you only have a few projects for your portfolio? So mine's a bit different because at the stage I'm at, I, I, I was either a senior designer or leading initiatives. So although much of the work is representative of my contribution to the projects, there's also other people that, that contribute. Plus, um, to really tell the story of, of a project, I have, you kind of have to at least at my phase or stage kind of tell a full uh, spread. I can't just say, hey, I did some sketches and here it is. So this project in particular, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. That's 11 slides. That's a lot. And even then that was me condensing down to um, some key areas I wanted to speak to or focus on. I think being ready as well to dive a bit deeper if you need to is important. So what I mean is um, my intention here with, with this portfolio, let's see, how do I zoom out? Okay. My intention here was to say, hey, you know, on a particular slide, if I need to dig a bit deeper, I could have a book for that project specifically to say, okay, now here's 50 pages showing everything I did. But really, this is meant to give just an overview of what I potentially can do. Um, so as far as how many pages, that's one way to go about it. If you feel like you have a lot to show and it's worth showing, don't include it all in the main portfolio, but say, hey, I can actually dig a little bit deeper if you'd like. I have another deck specifically related to this project. Um, particularly if it's a project, and I would say pay attention to what people are curious about in your work. And then if you need to expand and show a bit more, create that secondary uh, deck. I know we're over time, but uh, where, where did you learn to document your process? Um, huh, where did I learn? Actually, I would say going all the way back, I think, um, do I have that here? Sorry, I'm just looking at my bookshelf to see if I have it. I don't, um, I think it's in a tub somewhere, but I, when I was at Astro Studios, we as interns were made to document our internship at the end of, of the, the, the process. And at the end of every project, we would create a project book. So it's something I learned early on. And that was just a way to make sure that you had everything kind of collected. And I do that in smaller measure now, where as I'm working, I'll try and organize my folders. Here's my photos, here's my CAD, here's my sketches, here's my research, here's whatever I have. So it's all there. Um, but in terms of documentation, my first experiences were on my internship and we had you know thick, thick books because at least where I went at Astro Studios, we sketched a ton. Well, I know we're over time. Wait, I don't want to keep you longer. Um, and I know we've got some students who are probably are jumping out to some other classes that are coming yeah, up. Yeah, no worries. Um, Spencer, this has been fantastic. Thank you for taking the time. This is so valuable. Um, yeah, no worries. I'm happy, happy to do it again sometime. So just let me know and we'll, uh, we'll make it happen. Of course. How, how's the best way to keep up? Is it Instagram is kind of the best way to follow everything you're yeah. working on? Yeah, probably Instagram at this point. Um, I've been a little bit busier with with projects I'm working on actively, so I haven't posted as much. But Instagram is the best best place. You can always catch me on YouTube. I have a Discord server as well if if that's your jam. So um, all of that's on sketchaday.com. Perfect. 
great. Yep. Well, thanks again, Spencer. This has been awesome. Yeah, okay. thank you so much. It was a pleasure. You're welcome. Okay. Thanks, thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day. Thank you.